Thank you so much for having me. Um, so again, I'm an assistant professor in the sociology department. I have pretty close ties also with the Center for Justice, Law and Society. So some of my colleagues are here from that. Um, I also just like really like being at UMass. There's a lot of really smart, interesting work being done. And so you, maybe some of you have seen me pop around in places where I don't really belong. <laughs> um, like here. <laughs> so um, I am really thrilled to be here. Um, I came from a department that had a pretty strong um, like machine learning training and computational social science center. I was not part of it. <laughs> But I, but you know, you realize that like the way you think about the social world is actually influenced by the people you talk to in the hallway. And so I've, it's kind of been interesting to see where that my ties have developed here at UMass as well as a product of that training. I'm very grateful for that. So the talk I want to give today is going to be kind of weird. Um, so I guess like maybe not save the save the best for last, but save the weirdest for last in some way with the with the seminar. Um, so my title kind of alludes to what I'm talking about, but it's actually more. It's a really basic argument I want to make, and I don't even know if it's an argument. It might just be a, like a go doing good work with quantitative data, but I've been really struck by how um, impactful it's been to just think really carefully about numerators and denominators. And so um, as a demographer, you know, we're trained to think about social change and population change really as a, there's a model, an overarching model that suggests that we should think about all this stuff as a product of redistribution of populations, which we can also think of as normal people as migration, or natural increase and decrease, which is demography speak for births and deaths. And so when we think about that, a lot of the work that we do centers on correctly identifying and measuring rates Right, the the speed, the I guess like the velocity or the speed with which something happens in the population, and then also what explains all of that. So you can kind of see how that very simple, frankly like mathematical framework ends up expanding to help us ask questions about virtually anything. Right. So I use that approach to, to think about um, racial inequality and family inequality in particular. And over time, my work has really centered on institutions of social control, which is kind of sociology speak for thinking about um, social institutions and specifically, in my case, policy institutions that may have another policy in, um, intent, but have the effect of controlling the ways in which people interact and the ways that their lives unfold. Um, and I use... Uh, almost exclusively survey-based and administrative data. Um, so survey data might include um, nationally representative surveys kind of done by federal, federal agencies or large data collection projects, as well as some data that I've worked to help collect um, around family incarceration, for example. Um, I'm also working with some folks here at UMass um, on survey experiments um, using kind of um, task-based experiment designs and um, like exposing people to different stimuli to see how that can help us understand processes of social inequality and policy change. Um, and then for administrative data, I've used a number of different data sources so far that have include vital statistics records in partnership with municipal agencies, um, national databases of, and I'll talk about this today, child welfare data. Um, and so things that help us understand um, events and experiences that are actually controlled or shaped by policy institutions, but can help us learn about something more. Um, so I'm happy to talk about any of this other stuff, um, you know, today and onwards. I hope this conversation continues as like a way for us to keep connecting on campus. And I know that's one of the purposes of the seminar series. Um, so just to, to give you a little sneak peek about some of the types of recent research I do, and I selected examples that do, are not what I'm going to talk about is, you know, for example, we did a new, um, I was very lucky to be involved a few years ago in a new big expensive survey data collection effort to try to get an estimate for the proportion of Americans in the US who have ever had a family member incarcerated. So the cumulative, cumulative prevalence of family member incarceration, turns out that's really hard to measure and there aren't data on that. Um, and so this was our best effort at doing that. Um, the numbers were much higher than we thought they would be. And there's reason to suspect that would be an undercount because we couldn't survey people who are incarcerated themselves. They are also more likely to be connected to people who are incarcerated or have ever been incarcerated. And so it was a, clearly a sobering um, data collection and empirical investigation experience. Um, and those data are publicly available. So if you ever, uh, so about two thirds of people have ever had an immediate or extended family member incarcerated. We used a pretty broad definition as well to include um, non-marital partners, um, we explicitly ask people to include step and adoptive children because there's a lot of boundary making around family definitions, something I also study in other work. Um, and then if you wanted to only look at people, relationships defined as immediate family, um, that was 40, I think it was 45%. That was very high. If you think about the fact that the criminal legal system is really like purportedly designed to control particularly seemingly deviant or like non-common, right? Unless we think everyone's bad, right? Right 
that for those proportions are really high. And so we were really surprised by that, actually. And this was a team of people who have been studying incarceration for quite a while. Um, the other one of the another example that's maybe of more interest to the CSSI community is um, a big linked administrative data effort that took forever um, with the city of New York. So we worked in partnership with the Office of Vital Statistics and um, the Department of Correction to link their birth, death, um, there's birth health records attached to the birth records along with jail incarceration data for jail incarceration at Rikers. Um, uh, for those of you who follow the news, unfortunately, um, that has been very difficult research to do because there's a lot of other stuff that these agencies are tasked with. Research is not their primary objective. Very sadly, that project has concluded very unceremoniously as of like two weeks ago. So that was kind of hard to hear. But I was very, very grateful for the time that their statisticians and staff were able to put into that. But this is like one of the papers that came out of it. Just to, just to do an initial exploration of what would it mean to do a population level analysis of all births in New York City to see how paternal jail incarceration prior to birth, right during the gestational period, might affect health outcomes. So for those of you interested in causality, that might be a, that was a really interesting space to investigate. And then this last paper, I actually just published. I'm very proud of it, but it's literally just regression models. Associational regression models using the survey data in the first bullet point. Um, but this kind of, this last piece kind of gets at how I'm thinking about data. Um, that things that we kind of think of as estimation challenges or like non-interesting stories um, in analysis and quantitative analysis can actually speak to um, the assumptions we have about um, what it means to count things, what it means to measure things. And so that's where I'm going to pick up today. So um, today I want to focus on thinking about how a population perspective, right, thinking about denominators and numerators, can help us think about institutional contact as not like isolated to particular parts of the population, but as part of the larger landscape of social organization. And I'm going to use three papers to kind of illustrate different ways I've done that. And so because of that, three papers in, you know, however much time is overly ambitious and irresponsible. So I won't go into detail actually about the methods. So what I'm going to do is talk about the research question, what the, pro what the question or the problem is around the numerators and denominators with each of those questions, quickly mention what method I'm doing, literally like a bullet point, and then show you a little bit of the results and talk about what I think the implications of that are, both empirically and conceptually and theoretically. Um, so the reason I think this is important is it because it requires us to think really explicitly and declare what our assumptions are about family and social inequality and what institutions are supposed to do, um, and in addition to offering us with new empirical evidence about what institutional contact looks like. And just to, I think I said this before, but my work focuses specifically on the United, United States. And so um, what we can, uh, the way I theorize and conceptualize institutional contact is pretty specific to this context. So the three papers I'm going to look at, and I put them in reverse order because I like to think about it in the life course context as a demographer and somebody who studies family, children, and youth. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a paper that looks at home leaving and the transition to adulthood, a topic that is studied extensively in child development, sociology, family demography, and a lot of other disciplines. The second piece is looking at, um, at trying to estimate um, state-level variation, the cumul cumulative prevalence or the likelihood that a child will ever experience child welfare system involvement. I will talk a little bit about the policy context just so that I'm not assuming that people understand what the policies, the policy systems are. And the third one actually extends um, kind of the investigation of child welfare system involvement to think about what foster care or out of home care placement does for children's longer term instability in their care. And their okay. So the first paper just asks, when do, when do young people live, leave the parental home for the first time? Where do they go? So it's a pretty simple question. And the method itself is, I think, pretty straightforward. It uses a really standard uh, demographic technique to answer this question. And really, it's just about understanding when people go, what proportion of people are likely to leave the parental at some point by the time they reach early adulthood, and where do they go? So it turns out that the expansive literature on this um, focuses really specifically on problematizing and investigating delays in departures from the parental home over the last couple of decades, right? And so the it focuses primarily on the fact that there are certain subgroups of the population that don't experience this in the same way as others do. So all of these have focused on transitions into households, and this is a numerator problem, right? So that means we're picking up on very specific incidents and types of events to define a life milestone that is seen as important for so kind of social change and social organization, um, but only includes transitions to households. And that will mean like moving in with roommates or buying a home, right? Things that we may, um, are kind of like ideal typical ideas of what it means to depart from the parental home. And so that's where my question was. Um, as somebody interested in institutional contact, who are we missing, right? So again, as a demographer, 
What are we counting? Who are we missing? What are we missing? So if we think about um, estimates of parental home departure as being basically just various iterations of this very simple fraction, right? Who's departing? Maybe we add like a time subscript there. Um, who's at risk of departure? What goes in the numerator? So that's what I problematize in this paper. And so for this work, I use the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, which is used quite, quite extensively in the social sciences to look at labor market outcomes, like transition to adulthood, things like changes in family arrangements, relationships, but also household and living arrangements. And the, the crux of what I do is I just try to understand when people are leaving by the, by the end of what some people think of as early adulthood, like 31, um, what proportion of people have left, I looked at differences by race and ethnicity and parental education. I'll focus specifically on showing you the results for racial ethnic groups. But the move that I make here is just about the numerator. And sometimes when I talk about this study, I get a little embarrassed because it's literally just like, okay, yeah, the, the, the likelihood's gonna go up if you add more than the numerator. It's just a math thing, right? But if you think about what that's actually doing conceptually, it's actually a big deal. So the typical approach to studying departures, right, this numerator defining what a parental home departure is, focuses specifically on households. The only reason I refer to it as roster-based here is because the way that it's um, identified in the survey data that I use, which is used a lot for transition to adulthood research, um, researchers use a roster of like who's in your household at each wave, and that's how they identify whether you've left your parents' home or not. So are your parents listed, your birth parents or your, your parents of origin? I tweak the numerator. So what happens if we include institutionalization? People who have left for incarceration, military service, higher education. What if you live with your parents, but you're the householder, right? That's a very different parental co-residence situation than if you are seven years old and your parents own the house, right? Um, and so this, all I do is augment the numerator. It's an empirical question as to whether that will change our understanding of how likely it is that people leave at some point in that period of, of life. So these plots, the one on the left emphasizes what's called the roster based, or I'll call it like the conventional way of thinking about parental home leaving. And you can see that as we might expect, the likelihood of leaving for the first time in your late teens is relatively lower. Like that accelerates a lot. There are a lot higher proportions of people leaving. You're more likely to leave in your late teens, early twenties and onward, then it kind of flattens out. Um, and then the second plot shows a comparison between the conventional measure and then what happens if you change the numerator? Again, kind of obvious mathematically, you're adding more to the top, right? And then adjusting the denominator as needed. But what we find, what I find, right, is that one, it tells us that there's this kind of panic about people not leaving the parental home in the United States. If you, if you really think about all the experiences people have in adulthood, this is still a pretty high number, right? 89% of people leaving for the first time by age 31. But the institution inclusive measure by, by taking into account stigmatized and marginalized experiences also takes into account that people are making adult transitions away from the parental home. But it's much higher, right? The proportion of people who will ever, ever have that experience. Yeah, of course. I, di I did include college, right? And so I so leaving, leaving for college, meaning like you move into an apartment or a dorm, right? So there's also questions about that. Like, do we really consider that adulthood or not? So that's a question I've gotten a lot, right? And so if we take that out, that will kind of basically drop this line because that's an experience that a lot of young people have, but it doesn't eliminate the gap. Yeah. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but the, the method that I use is life table analysis, which is basically um, it's a population accounting tool where you think about like, what proportion of people, or what, what the cumulative risk of people having experienced something is over time. And I can talk about that in a moment, if people would like. So this is broken out by a race, broad racial ethnic category. I omitted the other racial ethnic group because that group really like, it's hard to make sense of what that means. And so you'll see that that, di that gap or like the elevated curve is apparent for all three racial ethnic groups. So basically that institution inclusive measures capture some aspect of home leaving that isn't captured in our standard way of describing that milestone. And so I also wanna, um, so just to kind of put some numbers to it. So I, I showed you the numbers for the overall cumulative risks using the two measures. But if you look at by, look by, racial, by racial ethnic group, you'll see that if we break out, so independent would basically be what maps onto what we typically think of as home leaving. This is what has been studied extensively in the literature. By expanding the numerator, we're also able to take into accounts like incarceration, okay? Oops, messed up something there. Um, 
And so there are questions around whether all incarceration spells really count as like meaningful long departures away. And of course, as somebody who is in the criminology space, I am, I think that's something to think about. But I think what the point with that, this is an example, right? There's a bunch of other types of transitions I included, but I wanted to highlight this one because if we think about how the criminal legal system treats people as they age, right? So if you're an adult incarceration facility, society has deemed you as an adult. Why don't we include that? Why don't we consider that an adult trans transition? Why do we exclude those people and keep them in the denominator when we think about transitions away from the parental home, right? Basically changing the numerator, right? De defining the numerator helps us more explicitly engage questions of social construction and what we're measuring and counting. And it also limits the, you know, using a particular numerator can bound or kind of open up the scope of our knowledge production. So the fact that there are these types of variations in the way people leave the parental home was not actually possible without adding things to the numerator, right? And so that's kind of like the conceptual move that I was trying to make in this paper. And um, while I expected that some of the results would be kind of pretty obvious mechanically, I wasn't expecting to find some of the variation that I did find here, right? So there has been a lot of research highlighting and emphasizing the relatively lower, kind of slower, delayed, complicated transitions to adulthood for young people of color. But if you look at the breakouts, right, Hispanic young people actually were more likely to make, have left the parental home for the first time through transitions to independent, like adult household transitions, which is what we think of, than the other racial ethnic groups, something that I haven't seen emphasized in the standard ways of analyzing home leaving. So that's one example of how like tweaking the numerator can help us kind of um, push the boundaries of what we understand about something that's been studied for like a million years, basically, to me, like intellectually, right? I do, so there, you know, I was expecting to find gender variation as like a big piece um, and I did not find, I mean, so, okay, that's overall, there were no differences, that meaningful differences beyond like what we see in the shift in the curve by gender. The one place where you would expect to see it are with military service and with incarceration, right? So again, what's interesting about that is that if we use like, right, this kind of approach where we have these two different ways of thinking about it, it's not really a case to say like we should eliminate the convention conventional way of thinking about it because that tells us something about what we as a society think means a transition to adulthood is. But by including that, there are like, instead of it being a panic about how like boys aren't growing up or girls aren't growing up, it's actually a question of where are they going? So if we don't include military service and incarceration as part of those transitions, we're actually eliminating some gendered pathways away from home that actually might help us explain what seems like a slowdown. Like, what does it mean to talk about people not growing up if actually it's just that they're being criminalized or engaging in military service at higher rates? So that's the one, the, it only shows up, and meaningfully so, thank you for asking that, in this examination of the pathways away. Yeah. I thought I was gonna see something um, in the overall risks because of the way the literature talks about gender differences, and I didn't see that. So the second example I have, and I'm going really fast, I'm gonna slow down a little bit, I'm getting overexcited. Um, I'm gonna switch away from thinking about, um, so my the first paper I was really interested specifically in incarceration and kind of expanded out to think about other institutions, but now I'm gonna hone in for the rest of the talk on thinking about the child welfare system. And so the first paper I'll talk about um, was, a, was a question about what, again, a cumulative prevalence type framework, what's, what's the likelihood a child experiences contact with the child welfare system? Um, and so I'll just start by saying that standard, almost all research on child welfare system involvement, so, and I'll talk a little bit about what the child welfare system is in a second, focuses on conditional likelihoods or contingent likelihoods, meaning like we are only looking at involvement or rates of involvement with the child welfare system at serious levels, conditional on them having been reported or conditional on some other criteria that the state has decided is important for thinking about, which means there's a denominator issue or question, maybe not an issue. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that's important in a moment. So the child welfare system is the US system's um, policy infrastructures for dealing with child safety, basically, particularly around abuse and neglect that may have occurred at the hands of a caregiver or someone who has frequent contact with the child, right? That could be a teacher, it could be a daycare provider, very frequently the parents or whoever the primary or secondary caregivers are. 
And so the system in the US is a report system, or if there's a suspicion from a caseworker, they can intervene. But basically, children and families can be reported to a system. So if we think about the universe of experiences or people processed or falling under the purview of the child welfare system, we can imagine referrals as being everybody, right? So everybody who comes into contact who's reported falls into this denominator that most research focuses on, right? So people who have been reported. And then there's a series of extremely complex, so the original picture was like a giant web of pathways, and I realized it's not super helpful for a talk that's not about specific policy pathways, so I simplified it. So after there's a referral, there is a screening process where caseworkers determine whether there's, an, whether there's reason to continue, right? In some cases, it might be a nosy neighbor who happened to catch like one interaction where a parent is yelling, and then there may be evidence to suggest that it's not really a case for concern around child safety, um, and so the, the referral might get closed and basically kicked out. But some proportion of those cases continues on to a response, which may require, which may involve an investigation, at which point caseworkers would determine whether there's enough evidence to suggest that there could be plausible continued harm to a child, and, it, and there needs to be a decision made about whether to, to proceed with intervention in the family system or with provision of resources. There's another stage at which there is a confirmation stage as to whether the re specific report made to the child welfare system agency took place or not. So this is retrospect, this is historical, right? So the report that was made is about a particular incident. Is there enough evidence to suggest that it happened or not? And that event is called confirmation of maltreatment. Okay. At this point, there are a lot of different ways where caseworkers in an agency might respond. It could include just checking in. It could re include um, requiring that the parents have to go to parenting training. It could, re it could include connecting the family to available social safety net services that may help address issues of neglect, for example, if it's just a, an issue of resource pr provision. In the most serious cases, children may get removed from the home and put into foster care, which could either be an institutional setting, like a group home, or in um, the care of a foster family. After that point, what's considered kind of the last point, right? a child may return to their original family of origin or parental rights will be terminated and the child will be put up for adoption, okay? But you can see, you know, using like economic speak or thinking about inference, there's a lot of selection, right? And so when we're talking about um, causal effects or whether a system harms someone or whether any of these experiences is bad, it's really hard to tease that out. So most of our questions, thinking about just the likelihood, or sorry, the research, just thinking about the likelihood of experience in contact with the child welfare system, focuses on this universe, right, this population of people who have ever been reported. So um, this was, I kind of got invited to do this work with people, with my advisor and a bunch of other people have done this, and it's really helped me think differently about populations and denominators. But we've actually focused on, I included this blank space, like who doesn't get reported, right? So there's a difference in what we can learn if we focus just on this, as opposed to thinking about the larger child population, child, po child population in the United States and all the families involved. Sorry, what is this one? Okay. So in thinking about the prevalence of child welfare system contact, instead of just focusing on the likelihood of experiencing like a subsequent stage or a more serious event conditional on having been reported in the first place, we've asked questions about what's the likelihood at all that over the course of your lifetime as a child that you will help come into the contact with this child welfare system. The reason why we care about that question is because those experiences are often quite adverse. Um, I would, this is mainly in the social work and child development literature, but there's evidence to suggest that it causes a lot of long-term trauma for parents. Um, it has a chilling effect on the extent to which they're willing to go get support for needs because there's a concern around you know, being apprehended if they go to the hospital and someone thinks that they've harmed their child. And so there's a chilling effect around that. Um, but also that it's been really racially and socioeconomically disparate in terms of who's, who's suspected of having harmed their children and who is likely to have their children taken away. So these really serious events are really unequally distributed across the population. However, it's, we know that now, having blown out this de denominator, but up until this point, we could really only say things about having been reported, right? So there's this whole social process here that happens around who should be reported, who's, who's behaving poorly, which children have been harmed, whose parents are dangerous, that we cannot, that we, we don't problematize. So 
in this kind of set of papers, we use a, a bunch of administrative data sources. And so the first two are actually um, aggregated data from state child welfare agencies. So it's just, it's basically case management data that gets synthesized and cleaned by the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. Sorry, the um, National Child Abuse, I don't remember the full acronym, N NDECAN, which, hold, which kind of furnishes these two data sets that have Pop, like US wide information at the child um, agency and um, even spell level for foster care placements um, on children who have been reported to the child welfare system and for other questions like who's been confirmed for maltreatment, um, who's been placed in foster care, who's had their parental rights terminated. We combine this with instead of child welfare specific denominators, denominators from population totals. And so I use life table, we use life tables here again, but a slightly different approach. Um, the first was a birth cohort life table. This is a synthetic cohort life table. I'll just mention that for now. But if anyone wants to talk about what the differences between the two, one of them is looking at children in real time as they have the events, right? So in the first one, in this one, we're actually trying to approximate seeing people over time using cross-sectional data. So I can talk a little bit more about that technique if people are interested. Um, in, in the papers, so we've, I, I've worked on a couple papers on this. We look at this whole series of events, I'm just going to focus on results of one um, to show to show you a picture. Um, so again, maltreatment investigation is if there was a report made and the agency decides we should investigate and see if the maltreatment happened. Confirmed maltreatment is the it's basically like a diagnosis or decision that the reported maltreatment took place, indeed took place. Foster care placement is a particularly serious response from the state or the local agency in response to the confirmation of maltreatment. And then termination of parental rights is kind of a more extreme situation where it's deemed that that home is not, it's not possible to make it safe for the child. Okay. So this is just a set of plots um, depicting the cumulative risks for foster care placement, right? And so um, these, this here, sorry, it's the color, I hope the color showed up okay for everyone. Um, so basically the takeaway is, right, like it's more common than you would expect in some places, right? Given that foster care placement is that you're taking a child away from their family of origin, it's reserved for pretty extreme cases of suspected historical child abuse and neglect with prospects of future child abuse and neglect. The fact that these proportions range in this range across states, both overall and across by racial ethnic group, is pretty shocking, right? So it's the same kind of feeling that I had in seeing the, in, under, in getting a number for what proportion of people have ever had a family member incarcerated, right? So, I mean, the, the thing to think about is that these policy systems are supposed to address very specific social problems that I think typically, we don't typically think of them as common or, univers or universally experienced, yet high proportions of children and families end up having experiences with those policy institutions. So there is a temptation to do an associational analysis about what ca causes all of these things. Um, and that's something I I'm looking into, but it's because this system, so I forgot to say this, but this system is kind of the data are collected and centralized at the federal level. They're administered at the state and local levels as well. And it's really different based on what funding states have, like who they consider as a good foster parent, how they define good parenting. There are some states where neglect is actually not considered um, a type of situation where you can even consider taking the children away because it's deemed as a material hardship rather than as a parenting issue. So there's so much heterogeneity, again, in how child abuse and neglect are constructed that it's difficult to say what is, what is causing or explaining these things. But at least on its face from a policy perspective, it's really, really important to think about just overall prevalence, right? So again, these are not conditional on having been reported. These are just overall population. So we've blown out the denominator, right? So it should have almost like the opposite direction as in the first paper. But so we're um, given that the fact that these cumulative likelihoods are so high is pretty shocking. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this would be this would um, it's like the the I guess per per thousand children. Um, so you can think of it as like sorry. Hold on. Oh, sorry. This was this was converted into per hundred. So it's it's per child. So I, yeah. So not per child. Sorry, per hundred children. Hold on. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's at the child level, not the family level. And so there if there are families that have multiple children, they'd be the families would appear in different 
I'm happy to, well, so there's a historical story. I actually, we can talk about that in a little bit, but I mean, one thing I'll say is that um, foster care, like the contemporary iteration of foster care is rooted in partly in reservation schools um, where indigenous children were taken away from their families to be like, like basically like, it was like a genocidal thing where they were, they're completely trying to change the way that they interacted with the world, um, de-link them from indigenous heritage and tribal nation states. Um, and so Minnesota is one of the states where that was pretty prominent. But I think, you know, it's, I would say that if for Native American children in particular, it's partly patterned around what areas that was most common historically. Um, but actually one really um, interesting case is the case of Maine, um, where that was one of the other places where it's been quite high compared to the other states in that region. Um, but they've had state efforts to try to um, basically do like restorative justice work around this because some of the children, um, the people who were sent away to these reservation schools are still alive as adults. I and mean, like their, ch their children have spurred from the consequences. But yeah, um, Minnesota is a place that has been impacted by that historically, but it's also true that many states have been impacted by that. Actually, on that note, I, was, I said I was going to say this in the Q&A, but I'll say it now. But Pennsylvania, well, I mentioned that maltreatment is defined differently across states. Pennsylvania is a state where child abuse maltreatment does not include neglect in the data. And so it, if, if it had the same definition as some other states, I imagine it would have a much higher risk. We can't actually backcode that in the administrative data. Again, it's like the promise of administrative data is that it gives us a lot of information. We couldn't do this with survey data, right? The pitfall is that we don't actually know what's behind the scenes. I actually am working, trying to work on that right now, but, um, and it is very slow and not going anywhere, but if we have thoughts on that. So with Pennsylvania, I mentioned Pennsylvania because there's a pretty particularly infamous um, reservation school or like camp um, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that's received a lot of attention over the years, but you wouldn't really know that it stood out in that way, um, looking at these risk estimates. But I think it's partly because again, these like state, between state variation and how the systems actually operate and define things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the empirical takeaways are pretty obvious. I didn't go through the numbers, but um, just that the risks are common, like the likelihood of that over the course of your childhood that you'll have an experience with the child welfare system is common, but that it's also really unevenly distributed across racial groups and across geographic areas. In terms of the theoretical takeaways, I've kind of um, harped on this, but you know, um, the debt denominator here assumes things about what the purview of the policy is like what is it what does it mean to have a policy system that's supposed to target something that's supposed to be relatively rare right like child maltreatment when it involves that many families and children and then the second piece um this is a little bit more like preachy but i think that the you know we we decide where we care about the inequality by deciding what the denominator is right so if we focus only specifically as we have in the past on these cumulative risks contingent on having been reported that suggests that disparities in child welfare system involvement, we have some idea about who, who, um, who's inequality we care about. Like, where do we care about the disparities? Whereas if we blow out the population, then we're worried about just whether child welfare system involvement is a lifetime, it, it's something to think about when we think about lifetime structured in an unequal way for different children and families. Okay. All right. So, the last um, paper I wanted to talk about is extends on this topic of child welfare system involvement. And I showed the plot of the overall risks by state and racial ethnic group for foster care placement. So again, that's removal from the home. Um, but there's a question around, um, I, so I, as a, somebody who studies family demography as well, I've been interested in, around, in instability in children's lives and their care and living arrangements. And so that can include, you know, which caregivers they have, but also the structures of their family and household arrangements. So. The question I asked here is whether foster care, right, an initial movement, take uh, removal from the home for safety reasons by the state, causes like kind of more instability in children's care and living arrangements. So basically, I'm asking a question about whether it's a trigger for like future instability in care and living arrangements. So um, this is again like a question of numerators and denominators. So in the past, well, actually, most research to date does not actually. Um, this is maybe too flippant, but it does not really look at or include the experience of institutionalized children when thinking about care and living arrangements. 
Um, I would go so far as to say that suggests that given a per contingent or conditional on there being a particular circumstance or diagnosis by the state, right, that that instability is just a given. Like it has to happen, even though there's a lot of evidence to suggest that care and living arrangement instability is bad for kids. Like given that these families and households have this particular designation, we can't study that in, in, in relation to the rest of childhood inequality and instability. The second piece is that um, standard approaches to studies of impacts of child welfare system involvement has also been conditional, again, on the, again focusing on the denominator, in that it focuses on the subset of children who come to the attention of the child welfare system. So that's kind of similar to the point I was making in the last paper, but let me expand a little bit on this. So again, here's this flow chart with thinking about a very stylized picture of how the child welfare system works. If we're thinking about the causes of foster care, right, on future instability, we probably want to know, like, who or what is shaping selection into foster care placement, in addition to being able to see beyond, right? But most, if not all, of the work in social work is not able to do that, in part because the data are very, it's difficult to get population lived with data on children, much less experienced with children who have this experience. So have really just focused on kind of following children post foster so the denominator is basically the group to see what happens later to see if they have a stable care rather than thinking about what role the state has to play in shaping. And that is of concern because, one, overall, instability has been found to be associated with higher levels of basically any adverse outcome for kids, right, except in cases where the home is dangerous. But then there's this question about, okay, well, if we're putting, you know, the, the shares of children that we saw in those maps into foster care, aren't we concerned about what that does in general? There's a, gen, there's a critique in the policy world, well, in, in the social work space and in policy, that suggests that we were just using it frequently. So if there's a negative consequence of causing instability, then in, or introducing instability into children's care and living arrangements, and we're doing it too frequently, then there's a larger concern around childhood inequality. But we can't really think about that if we're only comparing within this So there is a data set that I found that is a nightmare to work with and has been the, the cause of a lot of my IT problems since I got to know I just got the data in February, moved over after starting in Ju uh, like July. So, <laughs> um, so rather than focusing on that box, and looking forward at what happens to these kids, I'm using a data set that allows me to extend the denominator and expand it out to here. So that the comparison groups, we still don't, we still want to be careful about selection, right? So like, I, it's not really reasonable to compare children who at no point were at risk of having material hardship that would have them categorized as being a gutful household or have no experience with domestic violence at home and comparing them, their outcomes, with children who have been placed in foster care been through this entire trajectory of experiences and saying, oh, well, um, yeah, foster care is working, right? But, like, so that's just like a classic selection problem. But what, what I try to do with this data set, so this is the National Survey of Child and Adolescent Wellbeing, is that I try to use the fact that it has a carefully defined target population, which is the population of children whose families are investigated for child maltreatment, and with the idea that this big denominator gives us more, gives us a chance at helping understand or develop hypotheses around causal effects um, without expanding all the way to the whole po child population where we don't really understand. So just a chance, just an attempt to understand what the potential plausible effects if we had a causal framework could give us if we wanted to know what the effects of foster care were um, without sacrificing the clarity. So th just to be clear, this is a descriptive analysis, but it helps us move towards that understanding. So I use inverse propensity weighted log logistic and probate regression models to look at change and the number of changes in these different descriptors of children's care. Sorry, this is so texty. Um, so the idea behind using change, number of changes, is to think about not just change, but instability as more than like one type, one instability. So um, I'm going to focus on just a couple of these, but basically I'm interested in thinking about what the types of primary caregiver changes, right? If you're switching a lot between like a, a mom figure versus um, an aunt, like the role relationships, 
the specific primary caregiver relation, meaning is it the same person or not? Because we know that there's importance in having like maintained affective relationships with people, whether there's a secondary caregiver available, and then all, an overall descriptor of the living arrangement, which, and so I try to use pretty, um, the language in the paper is more inclusive than this, so basically a single parent figure, like single figure, caregiving figure, two parent, extended family, or extended non-family. So there's a more detailed description of like how I thought about these different descriptions of what this means, but the idea is to develop a typology that is inclusive of, inclusive of both foster and non-foster caregivers. That, that includes a lot more complexity, and so comparison of foster and so again, I'm interested in thinking about whether foster care placement is associated with elevated risk. Okay, so in addition to thinking about the denominators, I also have a move here around the numerators. Okay, so there is an abolitionist movement in the child welfare world that thinks that there should not be this kind of system at all, foster care system, right? That raises really difficult questions about what we do in severe situations where children are being harmed. So, Rather than bullying through a particular policy perspective, because I am a social scientist and not someone who actually understands the mechanics of that policy, I use two different sets of numerators. The one, I call this the all change measure, which includes any any changes in for each of these, right? So any change in caregiver type, any change in caregiver relationship, any change in arrangement. So these are this is a set of all change measures. And so those would include both changes that are within like foster care arrangements or transitions out of foster care, as well as change, changes that may have nothing to do with the foster care, right? So then I'm doing a comparison of whether children who do enter foster care have more of this compared to children who don't. However, given that this is a policy system, again, that is designed by, like purportedly to protect children from harm, it's probably important to consider whether some of these changes are necessary, right? So then the question in this set of measures is whether the foster care system introduces children more change and instability than is necessary to protect them from harm. And so what I do is I subtract a couple things. <laughs> Again, kind of mathematically obvious, but the findings were actually a little bit different than what I thought. So I exclude any initial changes to the foster care under the assumption that that was necessary to protect the child from immediate harm. And then also exclude a, a, what I call like a terminal transition, that is a transition to permanent, a permanent caregiver. That may be returning back to the family of origin. It could, it could mean adoption. So the data do allow me to identify that. Um, and these are based on it's both survey data with a, a series of the caregiver. I think if the child is old enough as a child, um, the baseline primary caregiver is what's available. And then also it's linked up um, some of the administrative which helps me get at some of the So again, these are all changed. Um, and And the goal then is to kind of both, as I said at the beginning, explicitly recognize like what assumptions we're building, both normative and kind of logistically about what it means to study change and instability, but also I, I think like actually help us make a pretty clear route to help us better understand the policy. Okay, so let's see. Yes. So, um, so this first set of, I, I focus on the results for primary caregiver like relationship, like who the person is. So if I was, you know, Tina's daughter <laughs> and then ended up switching caregivers to Krista, if I still had just one parent figure as a caregiver, that change would not show up as a living arrangement change. It's a structural arrangement. So this is kind of social network. So like the structure of that network is the same. But this would change because the person who's fulfilling that role in the relationship or that node is changing, right? So that's one way to think about that. So this is the um, this is what happens. So with the inclusive, sorry, I should have made the labels align. But if I'm using the all transition measure, as we would expect, children who end up in foster care, these are inverse propensity weighted models, are more likely to experience change in the primary caregiver and also substantially more likely to experience change in their living arrangement structure. So that's something we would expect in some ways. This isn't necessarily as obvious. My hypothesis, my kind of working explanation for why the living arrangement would change is because foster care placements usually privilege family structures that are seen as more stable, which is, there's, a, there's an ideology around what that might be, right? So in the past, for example, 
there were certain family forms that were not actually legally allowed to foster or adopt children. We can think of like two, uh, like a same-sex parent at his household. And so I imagine that um, some of the transitions that are happening from entry into foster care, for instance, might have to do with a change from a stigmatized family system structure to one that is less stigmatized, which also has to do with this. If I exclude the uh, types of transitions that we may see as necessary or protective, um, as you might expect, children are actually, well, actually, I don't know if we would expect this, but children are less likely to have changes in the structures of their living arrangements or the composition of those care networks, um, which, you know, some might suggest is, is a good thing, it's protective, it stabilizes the structure of the arrangement, right, the network. However, I was kind of surprised to find that um, the relationships are still changing. So even beyond the initial entry of foster care after the permanency, there's still more instability in who the caregiver is, which raises questions about what is being done in the child welfare system and beyond to um, prioritize stability in not just the arrangements, right, um, but also the relationships that they have above and beyond what, what is the uh, change that seems to be necessary. If we look at this by um, race and ethnicity, um, so this is for just the primary caregiver relationship. We see the same pattern where it doesn't matter if we use all transition inclusive or the more restrictive definition of the numerator. Um, we find that the children who end up in, or I guess I find, but children who end up in foster care, um, regardless of how we define the kind of quality that they define, are at elevated risk of having kind of more change, um, higher likelihood of change in their primary caregiver. I also just realized I didn't present the results for the number of changes, but the same goes for the, the number. So it's beyond change, it's also the same pattern for the number. Um, and when we look at the living arrangements, again, the same pattern, right? So um, elevated risks of likelihoods of change in the living arrangement if we include all transitions, but if we kind of separate out the types of transitions children are experiencing, there's some evidence to suggest that children have more stable living arrangement structures. Um, so I think we don't that. But so some of the, 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 I see this paper as kind of combining a lot of the empirical and theoretical takeaways that I repeated, sorry, the theoretical and conceptual takeaways that I reiterated before. But in this case, the numerator kind of helps us interrogate, like actually explicitly define what the purposes of the policy are, whether we agree with the policy or not. So if there's a if there's a group of if there are folks who are reading this and believe this or are understanding the child welfare system as universally harmful, right? Any transitions at all, right? A pretty like black and white vision of what transitions and childhood instability, caregiving or instability can look like. These inclusive all transition measures may be useful for that, but it at least helps to, to almost like bound our understanding of what we mean when we talk about change and instability. Um, Definition of the den denominator. In this case, might seem less obvious because there's some interest in selection addressing that. But one thing I, I this was particularly important to me in thinking about the design of the analysis because, um, th and this is probably too far of an interpretation, but basically it, it made me question the like, standard approach to thinking about foster care effects made me question the fact that there isn't, there wasn't really any comparison about whether children in foster care are doing a quote unquote worse than children not in foster care facility. It made me wonder if we're asked if we're just we just decided that well those kids are just gonna have to right and so it made me it, it that's a very flippant way of saying that but by not allowing for these comparisons that are really hard to make empirically that's kind of that 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 is a little bit of an assumption especially if we're not even done the work right um, and then I think the last couple of things are pretty um, clear but the way we define the numerator and the denominator found what we can learn the empirical evidence um, and then the denominator I just said this, the denominator basically demonstrates and how we define it how makes us engage who's of what kind of inequality we care about and what we consider inequality if we only care about ex looking at that not sure. but if we're only looking at this group we're just looking at describing foster care children because if we blow out the denominator and the comparison we're actually now asking questions about whether children that I've experienced these things are entitled to the same level of stability in the family. Children who might be similarly at risk of this experience, but don't have this. 
conducting state of threat analysis. Um, so I think that brings me to the end of my extremely fast like world tour of Min's weird thinking about easy math problems that help us think big about policy systems. So I'm happy to go back to any of this or talk about um, additional ways to think about these questions. And I also recognize like this isn't really like, I sometimes get into conversations about what computational social science is, and I had a lot of impressive them coming into this talk. I'm gonna talk to Ian about this earlier. But you know, I think the thing that brings it to this space is that we're all really just in the business of thinking really carefully about measurement, counting, and using quantitative data that aren't um, and so I think there's a lot that um, computational perspectives can bring to bear on these types of questions around numerators and denominators, how to use data carefully, but also, especially as you saw, like I'm bringing in a lot of like administrative data, which is really big and hard to work with and messy. And I think you know, um, there's uh, there are other projects where I'm more carefully thinking about things that are maybe more central to the computational social science space. But I do invite you know opportunities to talk more about these questions in the future, especially if you're finding that. You know, some of these particular topical applications of the methods aren't as common for your for your. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, huge, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, so I'll just repeat the question for the recording, I guess. So there's a, you know, one point about how, you know, it's actually pretty central to computational social science to think really carefully about, like, what's left out of the data that we're using. Um, and then the second piece around, um, you know, kind of, kind of some opportunity for further investigation around the dynamics that shape inequality, like spatial and racial inequality and how welfare involvement by thinking about um, a natural experiment that exploits the state variation in policy structures that would help us understand, like, what's driving I think that's true. I, I, I will say, that, so there's a new data set that came out that's like basically, I want to, it's like, an, it almost feels like an archival data set, but it's quantified. So that, um, it's called the SCAN data. And by the way, I wish I had a blackboard, but um, so N D A C A N um, is a data archive that has all sorts, I don't know, it's, uh, that has all sorts of data about um, child welfare system involvement. So it's actually the NCANs, the, oh, thank you. I'm in class. <laughs> Um, so I'll just just in case, you know, I, I don't know if there are grad students in the room, but you may be interested in, um, like, I think you probably have some really interesting innovative perspectives to bring to how to use this data that have really strictly been used, basically. Um, so this place has, they, they've just uh, I think added a second round, but it's called the SCAN data, um, and it's state child abuse and neglect policy. So I'm just starting to look at that with a graduate student to see if we can make sense of, um, patterns, like spatial patterns and like policy regimes to help us understand the path to outcome. I'm actually more interested in how race is constructed in the in the reporting system and how racial abuse is factored in processes. Very difficult to figure out. Um, and it turns out states have really different ways of collecting that information. So some states are trying to be race blind, don't have any questions except for whether the child is um, rolled in the level of this state because that matters for federal policy. And nothing else, and while like I think Massachusetts had like 
stuff roll like check boxes for racial answers. And you can think about how that might shape how it felt. But so I think I think you're right that there's probably something there. The hard part is that there's basically like infinite dimensions in which the system is different. And so it's hard to think about the clarity of that um, design given that there's like bundles uh, but I think you're right there's something there and there's more increasingly uh, there's more there's more and more evidence like data resources about the public. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I can provide a little bit more detail about this. So is there is there like a judge, like who are the decision makers in this policy? So here, oh, I'm gonna start from the beginning, but like referrals are like any, like any time. Um, so there's, uh, some of you probably have heard the term mandated reporter, right? So if you're a mandated reporter, like let's say you work in here and you notice you have a reason to come back. I think you're, I don't know if other places do that, but some places you probably do, like a childcare facility would be fine for evidence that's considered like potential evidence of child harm at home, like they're never eating, like they're always clean and dirty and like unshowered or like, they have potential signs of physical harm, you're actually legally required to report. The tab, the, the, top, the descriptions of who is a mandated reporter also vary from um, So that's another thing, right? So it, it changes the universe of people who could even feel like they, they're responsible to report, but it could be a neighbor, your sibling. Uh, they're also, um, I think there's, there's where the child actually calls for help um, to get help. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's like, Decision point one. Um, that also means there's like that never comes up. That was a concern. Turns out that was a concern, but that there was about that. At the second point, um, there's a screen in procedure, so it's literally called screening in or out, and that's the point at which um, the decision is made by caseworkers to receive the call. So this is not in. There's I'll describe this, but there's a caseworker who just got this permit based on the provided and the information collected, whether the call may, uh, merits an additional investigation, at which point an investigative caseworker is assigned, and they actually may actually do home visits, additional interviews with um, teachers or other people who may have information about the child's family system to basically build out, I mean, it starts to sound a lot like a call, um, and that's where kind of the crossover and the bleeding happens. So then there's an investigative caseworker, and at that point there's like a, a bunch of evidence collection um, and a designation as to whether um, they have enough evidence to substantiate or um, have a substantiation or indication decision, but basically whether the, mal the alleged maltreatment specifically reported in this report can be confirmed. So I'm being that specific because it's literally about this. It's like a chart, right? Like it's like it's like figuring out whether the charge is valid at that point, and then at that point. So the courts will get involved in figuring out um, what services or options have to take place if there's violence, physical violence, that's immediately like a help. So there's pathways that directly route these, um, this system into the criminal legal system. So like domestic violence, like that will immediately get routed um, in kind of in parallel with the criminal legal system. Um, but family courts get involved, um, particularly around um, figuring out what's especially if there's legal implications. Family courts are, are, de are necessarily involved with the That's not something that's included in, like, child welfare. It's actually, that's in part of the family courts. And then that also goes for uh, termination of parental rights and those types of decisions. And I won't go into too much of the weeds, but around that, there's also all these, like, policies that actually take the discretion out. So, for example, if a child has been in the foster care system for some amount of time, there's some cases where they'll immediately, like there's a there's a clock. Um, and so if parents have not changed their behavior or they're incarcerated and can't um, do anything about it, the termination of parental rights may automatically um, have to be put on the 
Oh, so using like random judges on that? Yeah. There is, so, um, I've cited so many of these papers, but there's a particular person, economist, who has used um, like the ra basically random like family court judge assignment as an instrument for thinking about um, causal effects of um, I think plastic surgery. Oh, Doyle, Joe Doyle. Um, yeah, so he uses that design um, and finds like pretty strong negative effects. Um, but that's people have like negative effects on like child outcomes, basically across the Yeah. Um, and I think he specifically looked at health, uh, future like delinquency, I think was part was one of the outcomes as well. He has a few papers on this using that design. But that's also been heavily there's like the estimates are like so he's he's kind of cited as having like one of the most rigorous designs, but it's like negative and I know there's like literature around that. Judging judge. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and I, you know, one thing I should probably do is at some point, I mean, I don't, you can't go to the same court, but like, just understanding more about what the, what happens in the courts. Like, I know there are books, there are some really good talks about that, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a design I've seen, but you know, it's, so there's those findings that are like, deemed decisively, like, negative at the impacting kids, like, in a causal way, and like, other, there's like, other studies that have been done that show that it's a positive effect because it helps connect people to the resources. I mean, the mechanisms aren't fully laid out, but it, it's pretty intense. Um, so at least the, the work that attempted to take positive effect, effect. And then there's a question of like, what is the in this, in this particular it's, it's just such a complicated space. There's also this like, this, but that, so, you know, the prevalence study. I, I've definitely been pulled a little bit in the direction of like, I don't know what Like, why do we have such a hugely, extremely expensive system? Um, you know, like, given this level, of, and this is foster care, right? So, so the maps are like boring, but also shocking for lower levels of education. Like, how, so how many families are reported? Like, I don't know, some of us may have had experiences of having like people call. Um, schools or whoever about what's happening to our kids. I know my parents had that happen to them because I was trying out a math test in middle school. Traumatizing for my parents. They just have a high strung kid, you know? But like things like that, when we think about what that does, like there is a I have a little bit of a pull towards the like, I don't know if I care about that. It feels like there's another question I want to do. Um but right, so but I'm just adding and subtracting. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, do you mean like is that question like kind of responding to a particular paper or just in general? Yeah. 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 Well, so basically, you can imagine like a stepwise, like um, I'm thinking of like two. Well, I guess like not two, four stage models where you're looking at. I don't know if it's getting like I can imagine trying to get like predicted probabilities of what, like advancing at each stage and then seeing what the residuals look like at each for each set of models and then looking at what prediction. I think I mean there's room to do that. I haven't done that. Um, I mean, one thing I saw was like like sequence analysis. I don't know if people are familiar with that. It's kind of a, so I'm using that in another paper on prog progressive prosecution, but like that's a pretty interesting non-causal way to think about where, like what what characterizes the divergence patterns um, through this type of perceptual involvement. Um, so I think, but I think you're right. I haven't really, I haven't thought about using um, these data in that way. Um, I have to look at whether that's possible. That's actually a really interesting point to try to use that as a way like because I am able to see some of this stuff in the data just to see like what what the pathways look like in 
data set. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Just to know. Yeah. There's a, I mean, and thankfully the data archive does the collect, like it's basically just admin data. They, they have, so, oh, I should mention this. Um, for the data, there's actually a requirement to report this for the agencies to send in their foster care data because that is directly tied to federal funding. So it's all funding tied reporting requirements that collect that. But now treatment data is not, re re it's not required. Um, I happen to pick the foster care maps because I think that's an interesting example of like an but if, if I showed you the map for um, the, the events that are recorded in other data sets in Afghanistan, we actually omit some states because they are um, like completely implausible. There's like, I think it was West Virginia had a like ridiculous number, and like they are, there are very high levels of numbers involved in that, but we couldn't make sense of why the number looked like that. Or like, I think we left out Pennsylvania um, because of the, like, it's just not, you're not comparing. Are only looking at sex type of fact. So um, we have that part, but in terms of calling, which is something I'm scared to do, but I'm going to try to do for this like race making paper that I'm doing, um, I anticipate I'll get a lot of. Yeah. Um, it, there's a lot of understandable defensiveness around that because it's touched so heavily and the case work so much. Um, and 